This is the ninth lecture in a series of 22 lectures on the chaotic kingdom stage in the Old Testament, the seventh such stage that we've studied. And uh, we've thus far looked at one of the minor prophets, the book of Obadiah, and now we want to look at, at this hour, the book of Joel. In our notes, we have the suggested dates for the book of Joel, 835 B.C. to around 796 B.C. And at the time that Joel writes, Judah was suffering a locust plague of unprecedented proportion. Now, this might have been the most severe locust plague, in fact, in all the Bible since the time of the locust plague when God was judging Egypt in the book of Exodus. And uh, Joel is used, I should say Joel is impressed by the Holy Spirit to use these locusts in order to liken the coming tribulation. In other words, he likens these ravenous insects to an innumerable army of vicious horsemen uh, with the teeth of a lion and the noise of many chariots going to battle. And what he's saying is this, that you citizens of Judah think this is bad, wait till I tell you about a future period, and of course that future period that Israel will be involved with turns out to be the tribulation. So during this terrible plague, the citizens are urged to call a special meeting and to confess their sins and cry out to God for deliverance. We don't know whether they did that or not, but uh, he says to do that in verse 13 of chapter 1, Gird yourself and lament, ye priests, wail, ye ministers of the altar, come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God, for the meal offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. And in verse 14 he says, Sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of God, your God, and cry unto the Lord. Now, we don't know this, but perhaps it was this at this very meeting that Joel uses this plague to illustrate as a foreshadow, we've already said, the future time when the real armies of Satan will invade Judah. I'm sorry, will invade the entire land of Israel. And so, by way of introduction, we can say that Joel, the prophet, may be thought of as both the apostle of Armageddon and the prophet of Pentecost. Now, with these uh, introductory words in mind, I want you to, if you possibly can, turn to the book of Joel, and I say this advisedly, possibly can, because I know a number of you are listening to these tapes, perhaps as you uh, go along in your car. Now, uh, let me make a suggestion. When we get into, really, these studies of the minor prophets, and particularly the, well, not only Joel, but the uh, some of the major prophets, too, like Isaiah and uh, Jeremiah, it's going to be necessary for you to study, if you're going to do it effectively, with an open Bible. So uh, may I just suggest to you that you might want to listen to these uh, while you're driving your car, but if you can uh, really plan, for the most part, to listen to them where you can have your Bible open. I think it will be of great help to you because I'm really going to, to summarize these prophets by getting right into their writing. In Joel chapter 1, we said that he is basically the apostle of Armageddon and the prophet of Pentecost. And I want to point out some passages now in Joel's book where he describes the tribulation and Armageddon. In verse 15 of Joel 1, Joel uses the phrase, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. This is found a number of times in the Old Testament. This is one of the earliest instances, by the way, we find the mention of the day of the Lord. It almost always refers to the tribulation, and uh, sometimes you'll read in the Bible the expression the day of Christ, and that speaks of the millennium. So if you can keep in mind the day of the Lord, a seven-year period, tribulation, the day of Christ, and a 1,000-year th period, the the millennium. 
Alas, for the day of the Lord is at hand, he said, and a destruction from the Almighty it shall come. In chapter 2, verse 1, he warns about this. He says, Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is near at hand, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, like the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, and there hath not been ever the like, neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. I'll comment on this in just a moment about this invasion, but notice the results of this invasion in verse 10 of uh, Joel chapter 2. The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withhold or withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong who executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? And uh, in chapter 3, I'll come back to a few passages here in a moment in chapter 2, but we're discussing now Joel's uh, statements on the great tribulation. Chapter 3 and verse 2, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will judge them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and have parted my land. Now, of course, here is a vivid and frightful description of the valley or of the battle of Armageddon that will be uh, reach its uh, climactic uh, part, I should say, in the, uh, in the valley of Jehoshaphat. The Valley of Jehoshaphat, well, before I say this, actually, uh, there, are very, there are a number of passages that speak about the Battle of Armageddon in both Old and New Testament, particularly the book of Joel and the book of Revelation. And this will be uh, a rather drawn-out battle as far as uh, time is concerned and also especially as far as the geography is concerned because apparently what happens is that the the northern part of this battle, and perhaps the jumping-off place, will be the mountains and plains around Megiddo. In fact, Armageddon, uh, Har is a Hebrew word meaning mountain, and Megiddo is a city in northern Palestine. You put them together, it's uh, Har, which is a mountain, and Megiddo is a city. And so you have a, a battle in and around the mountains of Megiddo. So this battle of Armageddon will stretch as far north as Megiddo and uh, as far south as Edom, and that's below the Dead Sea. That's a distance of 200 miles. And then it'll be bordered on the west by the Mediterranean Sea and the east by Moab, and that's a distance of 100 miles. And so you multiply 100 times 200, and you get some 20,000 square miles Someday the armies of the world will gather. And here now in verse 2, he speaks about uh, judgment in the valley of Jehoshaphat. Uh, Jehoshaphat is an Old Testament name for, many believe, the Kidron Valley in the New Testament. And the Kidron Valley is uh, located right outside the city of Jerusalem. It's between the Mount of Olives and the city itself. And uh, I think it's very interesting that our Lord Jesus, in John chapter 18, crossed over that valley. At that time, there was a little stream in it. And in John 18, we're told that he crosses the Kidron Valley uh, by way of a bridge on his way to Gethsemane uh, that night in which he was crucified. I think it's ironical that someday millions of people who refuse the midnight walk of the Lord Jesus Christ across the Kidron Valley or the Valley of Jehoshaphat uh, will uh, someday be forced to meet in that valley. Because in chapter 3, verse 14, Joel says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Sometimes evangelists use, uh, will use this uh, to, um, you know, during the invitation of a meeting and say, now, uh, 
The Bible speaks about multitudes being in the valley of decision, and tonight you have, you're in the valley of decision. You have to decide whether you're going to accept the Lord or whether you're going to reject him. But, well, certainly sinners have to do that, but uh, that's taking it out of context. He's not talking about an uh, invitational service at this particular time in this verse. He's talking about the decision of God to destroy the armies uh, during the last days of the tribulation as they bivouac and as they gather themselves in the valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley of Kindred, uh, Kindred, I should say. All right, now, in verse 9 of chapter 3, we have Joel continuing his discussion of this battle, proclaim this among, <clears throat> excuse me, proclaim this <clears throat> among the nations, prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up, beat your plowshares into, sore, into swords and your pruning hooks into spears, and let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come all ye nations and gather yourselves together round about. There cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Uh, interesting, in verse 10, Joel says that on that occasion men will take their plowshares and beat them into swords and their pruning hooks and uh, make them into spears. In Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, and also Micah chapter 4, verse 3, you read of the opposite. Instead of men beating their plowshares into swords, they'll be beating their swords into plowshares. And instead of men beating their pruning hooks into spears, they'll take their spears and turn them into pruning hooks. Now, of course, those passages, you see, reverse the order here because they speak of the millennium. But before the millennium, there must be the tribulation. So here we have the plowshares into swords and the pruning hooks into spears. Verse 12, let the nations be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the nations round about. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get down, for the press is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. In verse 15, he says, the sun and the moon shall be darkened and the stars shall withdraw their shining. So here we have a very, very fearful description of the valley uh, or of the battle of Armageddon and of the tribulation. Now, I said that Every time, of course, you find a prophecy concerning the dispersion of Israel. And by the way, let's go back again and review the four things, the four main themes and topics of all the prophets in the Bible concerning their prophecies. Number one, the first coming of Christ. Secondly, the second coming of Christ. Thirdly, the dispersion of Israel because of their sin. And fourthly, the conversion and the restoration of Israel. And uh, here now in verse 18, you have the restoration of Israel mentioned. It doesn't make any difference how dark a picture, how gloomy a situation, how horrible a period that these prophets predict, and they do that, and it's a day, it's day, they predict days of blood and sorrow and pain and death, but there's always the the rainbow, there's always the clouds being dispersed and the sun shining and the story has a happy ending. And you know, that's one of the great things about the Bible. I, it has a happy ending. I like those stories that have happy endings. I don't know about you, but I used to, before I knew better, uh, sit on occasion in the evening and watch those crazy Alfred Hitchcock uh, shows on television and and, you know, uh, I just didn't like the ending. It has some weird and, and wild and, and totally unpredictable ending. But I like stories where the bridegroom gets the bride and they kiss and ride off in the sunset and live happily ever after. And, you know, that's the way the Bible ends. In Revelation 21, we're told the bridegroom gets the bride. I like stories that have a happy ending.
and this story concerning Israel, and even after the horrible thing they'll have to go through, or in spite of the horrible thing they'll have to go through during the tribulation, the story has a happy ending in chapter 3 of the book of Joel, verse 18. And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Shedem. Now, the valley of Shedem, Shedem was a camp actually on the other side of the Jordan River, and this was in Moab. Uh, I'm sorry, this would be in modern Jordan, which would have been Moab. This was the final camp of uh, Joshua before he crossed over. He was still on the east side of the River Jordan. And uh, what God is saying here now, apparently, is that the Jordan River is going to be greatly expanded, and this entire valley will take in not only the Jordan Rift, as we think of it today, but Moab and modern Jordan itself will be blessed from that fountain in that day. And uh, so this passage has a beautiful end here, and then uh, a story has a beautiful ending. And then verse 21 he says, for I will avenge their blood that I have not avenged, speaking of Israel now, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. What a beautiful verse that is. Christ himself will reign in Zion. Now, Mount Zion is the highest mountain which rises close to the southwest corner of the old wall city. Last year, well, actually two years ago in 1974, it was my privilege to spend one summer on that mountain, Mount Zion, because that's where the American Institute of Holy Land Studies, uh, Studies is located, and I took a course in historical geography. And it was once within the walls of ancient Jerusalem. It isn't now, but it once was. And Mount Zion is held to be one of the most sacred spots in Israel because here is located the traditional tomb of King David, and above it is an upper room believed to be on the site of the upper room in which Jesus and his disciples at the uh, last Passover participated. And this is where, of course, he established the communion service. And this upper room has also been considered to be the place where the twelve disciples were gathered when the Holy Spirit came upon them on the day of Pentecost. This will be a very appropriate place where the Lord Jesus then will rule from Mount Zion. Again, verse 21 of chapter 3, For the Lord dwelleth in Zion. Now, before we leave the prophet Joel, I said he was not only the apostle of Armageddon, but also the prophet of Pentecost. And uh, if you'll turn now to Joel chapter 2, verse 28, and I think that you will uh, remember hearing these words in the New Testament. Quoted, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and upon also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Now, uh, of course, this was quoted on a very momentous occasion some six centuries later, in Jerusalem, perhaps during about the same spot where it was written, it was quoted by Simon Peter, and the day of Pentecost had taken place, and Simon quotes Joel and says, this is that which was spoken of by Joel the prophet. Now, actually, Simon was using this passage as an illustration of what will someday take place, but Simon Peter is careful to say, or I should say this, he does not say this is a direct fulfillment, a total fulfillment of the passage here in Joel. He does identify with it. But this passage in Joel 20, uh, chapter 2, will have its ultimate fulfillment in the tribulation. In fact, at the end of the tribulation. Well, how do we know this? Well, because of the verse that follows speaks of uh, pouring out his spirit upon all flesh. And then verse 30, and, same time now, element involved, 
And at that time, God says, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. So we know that these are verses that refer to the tribulation and not basically to Pentecost, although God does instruct Simon Peter to quote from them. And notice here, it says that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, etc. Now, this is an answer, I think, this prayer here, or this uh, uh, passage and statement here in the book of Joel is an answer to Moses' prayer in Numbers chapter 11, verse 24. On that occasion, the Spirit of God had come down upon some men. In fact, these men were El, named Eldad and Medad. You can read about it in Numbers 11. And they were prophesying and, and rejoicing in the things of God. And Joshua was a little concerned about this. And so he goes to Moses and he says, uh, forbid them from doing this. Uh, you're in charge around here, Moses, and uh, rebuke them. We shouldn't uh, allow him to do that. And uh, Moses doesn't uh, agree with Joshua at all. And he says, uh, to the contrary, he says, Joshua, would God that all of the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And uh, so during the tribulation, of course, God then will pour out his spirit upon all flesh, actually also upon all the tribes, because in Revelation 7, we're told that God will save and call to the ministry 144,000 Hebrew Billy Sundays. And these will be chosen from all of the 12 tribes. And in a sense, they will become prophets. Because you remember, a prophet is one who foretells and foretells. And uh, so they'll be able to, all the children of Israel will have representatives from their tribes doing that. All right, I think we could call your attention to other passages in the book of Joel, but basically, uh, if uh, you can keep those thoughts in mind, I think you can pretty well summarize it in your thinking. All right, we've looked at the prophet Obadiah and the minor prophet Joel, and now the third prophet that we need to check out at this time is that of Jonah. You turn now to the book of Jonah, if you have a new Schofield Bible, it's on page 941. And if you don't have a new Schofield Bible, I would suggest that you buy one. Often I'm asked, as I'm sure other Bible teachers are, uh, Wilmington, in your opinion, what is the best Bible translation and best study Bible available? And without even thinking twice, I unhesitatingly say the new Schofield reference Bible. I think this is better than the old school field. I think at that time the old school field was the best, but I think the new is even better for no other reason because it includes 83% new notes. And I have an old school field that I literally worn out and the covers are falling off of it. And so uh, I purchased a new school field and I use both. But I think the new probably is even better than the old. But at any rate, whatever Bible you have, turn to the book of Jonah. Jonah, our dates suggested here, ministers from 780 B.C. to around 750 B.C., a period of around 30 years. There are three Old Testament books especially hated by Satan. Of course, he doesn't uh, really enjoy, he's not too fond of any of the 39 Old Testament books or any of the New Testament books. He hates them all, but there are three that he especially despises, and he just turns livid at the mention of these. One, of course, is the book of Genesis, because this speaks, this prophesies the incarnation of Christ, Genesis 3.15. And oh, the devil just doesn't like that at all. And the other book that he can't stand is the book of Daniel, because this speaks of the second coming of Christ. There's more about the second coming, uh, uh, as far as the uh, minute details, perhaps, in the book of Daniel as in any other Old Testament book. So he certainly doesn't like to hear about the second coming. 
And the third book that the devil hates is, of course, the book of Jonah, because this speaks of the resurrection of Christ, the incarnation and the resurrection and the second coming of Christ. And I suggest to you that if you ever pick up a book on higher criticism, which is really a book on destructive criticism, and you note how the liberals and the agnostics attack the Old Testament, normally they'll center in, or that is to say they'll zero their attacks on three books, Genesis and Jonah and Daniel. And I think the basic reasons are because of these books That is to say, uh, what these books describe. And I think the only reason the devil wastes any time on the book of Jonah, and he really tries to ridicule this book, is uh, has nothing to do with this fish story we're going to tell you about pretty soon. I don't think the devil could care less whether a man was swallowed by a fish or whether uh, a fish was swallowed by a man. I think it makes any difference. But if he can ridicule that part of the story, then he can get our attention off to that horrible uh, foreshadow in the book of Jonah concerning the resurrection of his despised enemy, the Lord Jesus Christ. There are three basic interpretations to this book mentioned in your notes, of course. There is the mythological interpretation, and this says that the book is uh, a myth. It conveys a truth, but it's purely mythical. It'd be like Paul Bunyan or Robinson Crusoe And uh, this would be the liberals' approach. It's ridiculous to uh, read any historical accuracy in this book whatsoever. That's what they would say. And then there is the second interpretation. That's called the allegorical or the spiritual. Really, I think it should be called the unspiritual because it's a very Christ-dishonoring interpretation. And unfortunately, some Christians hold to the mythological or to the allegorical or the symbolical, or actually you could say the, the spiritual interpretation. And they say that none of this really happened, but it is God's way of conveying a message to us. It's sort of like the mythological, but it's supposedly a little more spiritual. And they say, for example, here, Jonah is actually a type of Israel, and uh, the Mediterranean Sea here is Gentile nations, And the uh, storm, that speaks of the hatred that the Gentiles have for Israel. And the whale here, uh, or whatever it was, the sea monster, is a Babylonian captivity. And they even have something picked out for the vomit. They say the vomit here stands for the remnant that returned during the days of Cyrus. Now, there's no doubt about it. Uh, These things can be applied. That is to say, uh, Jonah certainly is a type of Israel, no doubt about that. And the Mediterranean Sea is a type of Gentile nations, Gentilic nations. And the fish can be a type of the Babylonian captivity, and this vomit may be uh, a foreshadow of the return. But we've made a statement several times. Let's make it again. There are 31,173 verses in the Bible And every single one of those verses has only one interpretation. Now, we may not always find the right interpretation, but it has only one meaning meant by the author at the time that he wrote it. Now, any one verse among those 31,173 may have many applications, maybe a dozen applications, but only one interpretation. Now, when uh, the book of Jonah was written, it's about a historical person. Here is the interpretation. There was a literal man by the name of Jonah. There was a literal sea by the name of the Mediterranean Sea. There was a literal fish. And it is a literal, historical, actual event that took place. Now, we can make many applications, but I'm not going to give you that. I'm going to give you basically the um, the interpretation, not the application. So, the first is the mythological view, the allegorical view, and then, of course, is the uh, there is the third view, the literal, historical view, and that's the Christ-honoring view. Jonah was a real person. Second Kings chapter 14, we're told that his hometown is given, his father's name is given, and the king that he served under, his name is given, 
He served under the reign of the northern king by the name of Jeroboam II, the most powerful king of the north. Jesus believed in the historicity of Jonah. He didn't uh, allegorize the story or say it's a myth. In Matthew 12, Matthew 16, and Luke 11, on three occasions, our Lord spoke of the historicity of the book of Jonah. All right, and uh, uh, Jonah was from a city in northern Galilee called Gath Heper, H-E-P-E-R. And thus the wicked Pharisees in John chapter 7 were all wet uh, when they had a conversation with Nicodemus, who actually had uh, pretty well taken a stand, although it wasn't a very strong stand, but it was a known stand for the Lord Jesus, and they were trying to put him to death even then. And Nicodemus says, now wait a minute, does our law try a man, be, you know, kill him, condemn him before he's received a, f- a fair trial? Don't you think every man has his day in court? And they turned to him and sneered and said, well, uh, you're not much of a Bible student, are you? Uh, search the scriptures. You'll see no prophet comes out of Galilee. And uh, this Jesus has been living in Nazareth. I'm sorry, he's been living in, in uh, Capernaum, and that's in northern Galilee. No prophet comes out of Galilee. Well, it wasn't... Uh, Nicodemus that had not been reading the scriptures, it was the ignorant Pharisees, uh, because Jonah, one of the great prophets in the Old Testament, did indeed come from the land of Galilee. All right, now, this account includes the greatest fish story of all time, the book of Jonah. Now, you know that, don't you? But now, wait a minute, let me finish it. But this has nothing to do with Jonah being swallowed by a sea monster. I'll go back and repeat that statement. The book of Jonah tells us about the greatest fish story of all time, but it's not what you think it is. And I'll comment on that a little later on. Jonah is probably the greatest missionary book in the Old Testament. You do not have to wait till you read the words of Jesus in Matthew 28 to read about a missionary call. Jonah here in the Old Testament, some seven, eight centuries before Matthew 28 was written, receives a similar call to go to Nineveh and become a foreign missionary telling them about the Lord. I think also Jonah is, can be seen as a tragic commentary on two passages in the Bible. Romans 7, verse 18, and then Luke 15, verses 11 to 32. I think it's a sad commentary on these verses. Luke, uh, Romans 7, verse 18, reads this way. Paul says, and he writes this as a believer, the apostle Paul says, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. When we come to Jonah chapter 4, we'll see that perhaps Paul had that statement in mind when... uh, he wrote it, uh, that is to say that perhaps Paul had Jonah chapter 4 in mind when he wrote uh, Romans chapter 7. I know that in me, that is, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Jonah does something in the fourth chapter that's absolutely unbelievable. And uh, I said it's also a commentary on Luke 15, uh, verses 11 to 32, and that speaks of the prodigal son's return after uh, spending his money in riotous living, and the father rejoices, but the elder son is extremely critical. And uh, the whole message there, of course, is not the prodigal son, but the, the elder brother. And I think when we come to Jonah 4, uh, we can see also a similarity between that elder brother, that jealousy, and the attitude that Jonah expresses and demonstrates in the fourth chapter. I believe this will conclude the introduction of the book of Jonah. And uh, now, if you will, turn to that book itself, if you've not done that. In verse 2, we have his call. In your notes, I believe we have the outline. I'm using another series of notes to make these lectures, as you probably realize by this time I have not simply just taken my notes and read them. And let me just stop and say this, class, I uh, 
by the grace of God, we trust to have some 10,000 people enrolled in the Liberty Home Bible Institute in the next 36 months or less than that. At the time of the making of this tape, we have well over 2,000 already enrolled. And do you know, you deserve the very best that I can give you. And the Lord has really convicted me about this, and uh, he's laid on my heart that the fact that you paid a lot of money for it, we hope you're getting your money's worth, but you paid a lot of money, uh, $900 almost, and you're spending hundreds of hours, hopefully, you will have spent that before you go through the course, listening to the tapes and doing the homework, and I know your time is at a priority. And God has laid on my heart, he said, Wilmington, all these thousands of people listening these hundreds of hours, he said, hot shot, you'd better do the best you can because you'll answer to both these students and myself at the judgment seat of Christ. And let me tell you what I did. For this chaotic kingdom stage, I hadn't meant to say all this, but perhaps these words will help some of you. I had spent many, many hours preparing the notes, and that's the hardest stage, of course, to to summarize, because all the kings of the north and the south and the prophets and the, the places, and, and, you know, you have to have a scorecard to know who's on first. And so uh, a few months ago, I began to make these tapes for the first time on the chaotic kingdom stage. And uh, so I opened my regular textbook, Basic Stages in the Book of Ages, and uh, I sort of summarized by using that. And I made four tapes. And the Lord really rebuked me. He said, all you're doing in this stage, you're just reading your notes. Now, uh, you do something better. These students deserve better than that. And so I closed that textbook, and I began to read and research, and I spent at least 60 to 70 hours in preparation, in addition to the work I'd already done on those notes in the chaotic stage as recorded in your textbook. The reason I've done this is because I feel you deserve the very best that I have, and what I should do is give you nothing but my best. It may not be very good, uh, but God doesn't demand good things. He demands our best. But what I'm saying is this, uh, class, I feel that uh, you owe me your best too. I want you to give this study to get into the Word of God and give it the very best that you have because I want you to feel that someday at the judgment seat of Christ, you possibly will give an account to me as well as to the Lord Jesus concerning how faithful you were in studying these lessons that we're attempting to give to you. So we're a team here. And we need to keep in mind we're both going to answer to the Lord Jesus. I want to do the very best I can with my life, and I know you do too. Uh, I don't want to preach here, but let me just bring one more thought to you. There's a beer ad that I don't like at all on television, and yet it is contains as much truth as John 3.16. Now, let me tell you what it is. I think it's Slits Beer, and it says this. The advertiser says, advertisement says, you only go around one time and you got to grab all the gusto you can get. Now, do you know that's true? Humanly speaking, down here, we only go around one time, and we're going to do anything for the Lord. I mean, we got to grab all the gusto we can get because tomorrow we may be out in eternity. Now, my life is pretty important to me, whether it is to anybody else, I don't know, but it's the only life I've got, and I want to do something for Jesus, and I know that you do too. So let me just, if you're taking these uh, lessons in a haphazard manner, and you're, I hope that you'll uh, bow your head now and, and close your eyes and ask Jesus to forgive you like I had to do and tell him, Lord, I'm going to do the very best I can so that you can use me if the Savior tarries. All right, verse 2 of chapter 1. Arise, go to Nineveh, God says, that great city. And cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. In your notes, and when I started to say before I got bogged down, I've divided Jonah in these four chapters. Jonah uh, protesting, chapter 1. Jonah praying, chapter 2. 
Uh, Jonah preaching, chapter 3, and Jonah pouting, chapter 4. And he certainly protests here in verse 3 of chapter 1. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish. Perhaps this was modern Spain. From the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Apparently he attempts to get away from the presence of God. But let me just say, you can't get away from God's presence. Uh, in Psalm 139, David asked that question, How shall I get away from you? If I make my bed in the shield, if I send into the heavens, if I say the, the clouds or the darkness will cover me, uh, yet I'd be wrong if I'd say any of these things. I can't get away from the presence of the Lord. And by the way, I think this is a strong argument for the doctrine of eternal security. The fact that you cannot get away from the presence of God. Some folks say, well, you know, Wilmington, if I believe once saved, always saved, I think I could go out and live like the devil. And, uh, you know, uh, and I wouldn't have to worry. No, the very fact that you know you can get away from God and he is watching you and you're not going to lose your salvation. You're still his child. And because you're, you're his child, he's going to wail the daylights out of you for doing these things. Uh, that, to me, is a strong argument for eternal security. The very fact that, as Jonah would find out, you can't get away from the presence of the Lord. Uh, let me just tell this little story. Uh, I come from uh, southern Illinois, uh, midwestern, actually, Illinois, and uh, there's a uh, a county, I used to pastor a church in Griggsville, Illinois, and there's, that's in Pike County. In those days, there was a, a Republican farmer lived uh, in Pike County, and I knew of this man, and, and he was strong a Republican. And he used to tell a story during the early 30s when uh, Roosevelt was, I think it was 1936, Roosevelt was running for re-election. It was Al Smith or Landon, I forget now, but one of these... Uh, uh, men uh, was opposing him, and uh, so at any rate, uh, uh, the, the fellow's name was uh, Fred W. Kaiser, and he was the uh, uh, the farmer, and so he had a wife named Kitty, and so he used to tell that story. He said, you know, he said, I didn't have a radio in those days, and so he said, I came into uh, to the courthouse there in Pittsville, Illinois, to listen to the election, and before I left, he said, I told my wife, I said, Kitty, if Roosevelt carries Pike County, we're moving. And he said, you start packing. And so he said, then the returns came in. He said, I got on the phone about midnight and I said, Kitty, unpack. There's nowhere to go <laughs> because Roosevelt had taken every state but two. And what we're trying to say here as we conclude this tape and we'll finish uh, the book of Jonah, the next tape, Joda. Uh, Jonah is going to find out, much to his uh, embarrassment and uh, agony, he cannot escape and he cannot flee from the presence of the Lord. He can take himself out of the blessings of God, but not out of the presence of the Lord. All right, we'll stop here at this time, and during the next lecture we'll finish up the book of Jonah.